um, there are some terrifying developments going on. One of the most frightening ones is there's a new book out. Um, I apologize, I think Shanna Swan, maybe it's called Countdown, um, where she's basically saying it's 2020 and since 1970, by the way, the sperm counts are down 50%. Um, without going into too much detail about that, I mean, if the sperm counts keep going down, it seems to me fertility becomes a bigger issue and that's a pretty fast way to get yourself into horrible trouble. Um, at the same time, there seem to be, um, we have a speaker named Stephanie Senoff speaking in the next few days, who is saying, oh, by the way, you know, according to the rates, and she's an MIT scientist, um, we expect autism to be one in two by 2035. So things like this, along with just a dramatic increase in obesity from 10% to 40% in the last 50 years, increases in diabetes, increase in all childhood development disorders, asthma, allergies, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, the not even and just on a separate thing that the chemical the extinction of wildlife, the extinction of insects, the extinction of bees, the ocean dead zones. Um, are you of the opinion that these things are correlated with toxic chemicals? Big question. Um, so, so to start off with, Shauna Swan is a colleague and a friend. She actually wrote uh, a chapter on, really great chapter on how medications are endocrine disruptors. It was fascinating, particularly NSAIDs and how they work and how they break off and how they mixtures, you know, obviously chemicals in our bodies don't act alone. They can be synergistic in terms of their harm. Um, she also, I did interview her for the Smart Human podcast, which we're going to be releasing, I mean, in a week or two because we're backed up, but some really great speakers. She was, um, as a colleague, was kind enough to be a guest. Um, yes, her work is extraordinary, and I'm glad that her work is getting the attention it's getting um, because it may actually help to, um, to really pay attention to what we're doing to ourselves. And I think that's really, you know, you need to have almost something smack you in the face culturally, um, you know, to really make people wake up. And, um, you know, the, the concept that we have been slowly, um, you know, working against ourselves with all of these chemicals and that it's affecting some of the most, you know, primal and basic human, you know, activities and, you know, joys of, you know, reproduction and, and you know, fertility and, and offspring is just, it's so shocking to, to many people. It's shocking to guys because God knows no one wants to have a low sperm count. It's not sexy. It's not cool, but it's actually a real problem when it comes to procreation in the big picture of anthropology and our species. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned this morning, I tried to get in some exposomics and try to mention that you know, not one chemical is going to necessarily cause one thing. I mean, we are exposed to chemicals all day from all different aspects of our life, whether it's, you know, the microplastics of a tea bag or, you know, the nonstick pan we cooked our eggs in or the plastic glasses I have on my nose to, you know, the feminine care products someone's using in terms of those chemicals. We're always sort of inundated. And, you know, our development of disease is really dependent not just on one, necessarily one chemical um, or, you know, specifically maybe an EMF exposure. It's this combination of um, a dance really between our genetics, our lifestyle and our environmental exposures. And all of those three things really put together add to whether we express disease or not. And that is called our exposome, our exposomics. And it's really these proteins that sit in our genes and whether or not they allow a genetic sequence for Parkinson's to get expressed or Alzheimer's or um, autoimmune disease. And so, like I said, you can, you can you know, have this you know, exposure realm, but it's what we do about it that has shown to be effective in reducing um, the exposures, and that includes the lifestyle aspects of exercise and sweating and sauna and doing things that are anthropologically appropriate 
um, for, for reducing chemical exposure, breaking down chemicals through phase two conjugation of the liver and the kidneys, um, helping to get rid of these chemicals. It's sleep, it's managing sleep. We now know an enormous amount of information about sleep and how we have a glymphatic system, which is a fluid filled system around our brains that cushion the brain, but also help to remove some of the chemicals that we have been exposed to on a daily basis. It's like a, a washing machine. Um, and, you know, getting enough sleep reduces inflammation, inflammatory markers, helps with cognition, pain, um, a perception um, in terms of what we deal with chronic, in terms of chronic illness. Um, and so, again, getting good sleep is not just about turning, you know, uh, you know, removing the chemicals and the crappy food and the processed food and the drinking water chemicals. It's also about turning your phone off and keeping a distance and not getting near your head and not looking at social media before you go to bed and reading about horrible things. And, you know, so there's this sort of this combination of things that we need to think about instead of just honing in on one particular exposure. We do have, you know, from an occupational health studies, we do know that there are specific groups of chemicals that do in fact, you know, I don't want to say cause cancer, but it's pretty darn close because of the associations and exposure risk and time period and age of the um, you know, like for instance, far migrant farm workers have been well studied in terms of pesticide exposures and organophosphates. Um, but, you know, it's very hard to take away the confounding components, um, you know, and really prove that in a, in a well done double blinded placebo controlled study. But we do know that those associations are pretty strong, especially among occupational workers. Um, but that being said, um, I think when you describe all of those horrible things about extinction and oceans and, you know, to me, it, it makes me shut down and, you know, it, it makes me feel, you know, I smile because I don't know what else to do and I feel like I need a drink and what I'm trying to actually, I'm assuming other people feel the same way. What I would like to do is just simply give as many reasonable ways that are evidence-based in reducing those exposures and focusing on the empowerment instead of the destruction. Because I think we'll get a lot further when we kind of make our small changes over time. It feels good, it's represented in, in our breast milk and our urine, in our um, sperm quality. We can see changes that can be made and affect us physiologically. And I think that's where we need to go in terms of, of our movement forward. It's a daunting world ahead of us. Climate change doesn't add much good stuff. Um, but we can do this at least to start on an individual basis where we have control of our home, our bodies, our kids' bodies, we can make a lot of great decisions. Um, and that's really the basis of a lot of the work I do. I try to stay away from the negative, believe it or not, because it's just too overwhelming. And I really stick to the positive, proactive, great studies that show improvement. Mm -hmm.